It's Mr. Carroll again here with the second part of breaking the chain. So in the previous video, we talked about three different ways that you can break the chain of disease transmission. One of them is physical distancing. The other one is having herd immunity. And the third one is vaccines. And so we talked about how physical distancing is the easiest to implement and how herd immunity is really, really hard and takes a long time to implement and there's a lot of unnecessary suffering. And the third part is vaccines, which helps speed up the whole herd immunity idea without as much suffering. So we're going to look at the history of vaccines today. So it started, the idea of vaccinations have been around in different ways for a really long time. But in Ming China, which is roughly the 12th to the 15th century, although this was happening a little bit earlier, so through the Mongol China, but anyways... In China, they were practicing something called smallpox variolation, okay? And this is where they take some, some material from the smallpox of a person who is sick and recovers. And it's kind of gross, but they dry out that material. And they end up blowing it into the people's nose. And there's a lot of ceremony involved with this. They have these special silver pipes that they use. Um, and it takes some time to prep the materials. So it's not like you're kind of going in with someone who's sick and then getting it from them. But you're, you're drying out this material, which can be scabs, which is kind of gross. And then blown into their nose later. Then these people who are variolated are isolated. And... Because during this time, they often have a milder and less deadly form of smallpox, but they still are contagious. So they're isolated, and they go into quarantine. When they come out, they're all better, and they don't contract the wilder, more deadlier forms of smallpox. Now, this kind of spread through India and via trade routes into the Ottoman Empire. And that's where the Italian doctor, Emmanuel Timoni, wrote about it in 1714. He kind of... Um, Notice this happening in Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, and he uh, wrote about this in a, and it really was an article that didn't get a lot of attention until Lady Mary Wortley Montague, who is the wife of the British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, and Cotton Mather, who was a Boston preacher, read about it. And they read about it both around at the same time, 1721, and started to introduce it, the idea of variolation beyond just these um, the Ottomans and the, the Chinese. Lady Mary Wortley um, had her children worry-related so to protect them from some smallpox. She did this because she had lost her brother to smallpox and knew it was better to get a milder form of it, which this variolation causes, than to get the more natural, deadlier form of it. And Cotton Mather, when he read about it, he there was an outbreak that was happening in Boston at the time and he was able to inoculate a lot of people using this. Um, and he actually learned about it from some of the slaves that he owned at the time because they were taken from the Ottoman Empire and saw it happen in there and brought it over to Boston. And he had read also in conjunction, he had read Dr. Timoni's paper. And so using that knowledge, they started to do this smallpox variolation. But it still meant you got sick with smallpox. So the next thing was to kind of have develop a more sophisticated vaccination. So in the 1760s, Dr. Edward Jenner heard about milkmaids not getting smallpox. And he went and interviewed them, and he discovered that they would contract cowpox, which is, a, which is mild when humans have the disease. So the humans, when a human gets sick, sick with cowpox, it's not as bad for them. He experimented on a, an eight-year-old boy called James Phipps, and discovered that when he was given cowpox and allowed to recover and then be introduced to smallpox, James didn't get the smallpox. Eventually, by 1798, Dr. Jenner discovered a way to transfer this from person to person so you didn't have to go and milk a bunch of cows to get cowpox. This is also part of the reason why we have the word vaccination. In Latin, the word waka means cow. All right, and so we, vaccination is the thing that's coming from the cow. Now, smallpox up until this time was a really, really deadly disease and really, really easily spread. And so people lived in fear of smallpox, smallpox outbreaks all the time. And so having this milder form of the disease that they could contract 
and then lived through that inoculated them or protected them from the more deadlier form made everyone really, really excited about t- about taking these vaccinations because they were living in so much fear of getting smallpox. Now, up until this point, you needed to have either a part of people who were sick and dried out and given, and that kind of was a, a gambit on if you got a mild form or not, or you needed to have a disease that was similar to the more deadly form and kind of vaccinate them through that way. Well, in the 1880s, Louis Pasteur, who's known for his rabies uh, treatments, kind of advanced the work of Dr. Jenner and Dr. Snow. All right, He was working on germ theory and working with vaccinations, and he found a way to weaken the bacteria and use that as a vaccination. And this allowed people... So uh, this allowed him to develop a vaccination for chicken cholera and anthrax. All right, so he didn't have to find a similar but mild disease to the ones that were causing a lot of problems. He was able to weaken the original disease and use that in the vaccination. And at this point, it became a point of national pride to have all these vaccinations, all right, because people were suffering and dying from these diseases up to this point. And so a lot of, at this point in the 1880s and 1890s, a lot of people would go out and get smallpox vaccinations or these other vaccinations, depend, get these vac- chicken and, and anthrax vaccinations for their animals so that they could protect them. Moving into the 20th century, we saw a whole boom of vaccinations. Right? It's also the same time that we saw a really big development in germ theory, we saw a development in antibiotics, but we also saw a lot of advancement in, in vaccinations. Polio is the big one. Dr. Jonas Stalk and his team... He's not, he's not, he did this with a group of people. In 1952, developed a vaccine that worked and prevented children from getting polio. In, and you could see a marked reduction in the, vac, in the disease spreading. In 1953, 35,000 children got polio. In 1957, after a lot of campaigns of vaccinations, 5,600 got it. And in 1961, only 161 got it. And this is this idea of herd immunity, right? People can't spread these diseases around. The disease has nowhere to spread, and so fewer and fewer people get it. Because of these vaccines, smallpox has been eradicated in the wild. There's no more wild forms of it. You can't go somewhere and accidentally get it. And polio has almost been eradicated. There's still a few spots that we're working on, but it's really, really close that nobody will have to suffer through these diseases. Also in the 20th century, the measles, mumps, and rubella where the MMR vaccination was developed, diphtheria, hepatitis A and B, rotavirus, which is a stomach flu, and typhus were all, all these vaccinations were discovered along with a bunch of others. There's still more that people are trying to work on, but this is a huge, huge advancement. For, for thousands of years, people have been living in fear of infectious illnesses, when in an, and all they could do is physically distance or hope that it infected enough people and didn't kill them to get herd immunity. Now we had a way to advance that idea of herd immunity and give these vaccines to people. All right? And it's why so many people are working now in May of 2020 on vaccines for the new COVID-19 virus. So how, what does a vaccination do? How does it connect to breaking the chain? So it primes your immune system and it causes a response but from a weaker strain of the virus. So it's kind of like teaching your immune system what a virus looks like and what to do when you get to that. And so then your immune system, which is an amazing thing anyways, will remember how to fight the disease when the stronger strains come and are able to protect you from those stronger strains. Now, some diseases like the flu are really, really fast evolving, and that's why we need vaccines every year. But other ones... Uh, not as fast to evolve, um, and you just take one vaccination of it and and move on. We're not sure where COVID-19 falls yet. We're still studying it. Now, not only does it protect you, it more importantly blocks the spread and protects a lot of other people. I bring back this map, this diagram here from the last slideshow. Remember, there was two parts where it showed how you could get spread if nobody had the vaccination or nobody did social distancing. And here it shows... If we can imagine that the the person on the right-hand side, where the X is, he or she got a vaccination, and now they're not spreading it to all those other people. 
and it's helping to build up this herd immunity without having to ha bring undue harm to other people. And that's an important thing to remember, is this is a way of kind of helping out everyone in the community. So thanks for watching this video. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them below or in the comments or email me. I hope you continue to stay safe and wash your hands, and I look forward to you coming back here next time for the next Pandemic and Public Health video.